we're going to go ahead and get into the review of texts that I believe will show what the early Christian view of Jesus was, according to Polycarp. And so we're going to go ahead and start out with his letter to the Philippians. Like Paul, Polycarp is believed to have written a letter known as the letter to the Philippians in which he talks to them about various things, even refers back to the letter that Paul wrote to them and how they were one of the more outstanding congregations, but that based on what they were dealing with at the time he's writing to them, they, they weren't the same type of congregation. Things had changed. So let's take a look at some of the things that Polycarp wrote. Probably in the early part, early to middle second century is when this letter could be reliably dated because Polycarp and another early writer we're going to consider very soon, Ignatius. Well, thank you very much, GL. Good to see you. Appreciate the super chat as well. It's very kind of you. You're always a very um, enthusiastic supporter for what we do because I know it means a lot to you. So thank you very much for your encouragement and support. So you you have Polycarp and Ignatius. Uh, Polycarp references Ignatius. And so now Ignatius is a whole different subject that we're going to have to deal with in terms of the authenticity of the shorter or longer version of his writings. But either way, I don't think either one presents a problem in terms of biblical theology, but you know, there are some differences that we, we will and need to consider when it comes to Ignatius in terms of his texts. We don't really have that problem with Polycarp. We have fairly good early references to him in Eusebius. And it's believed that there's actually a note with uh, one of the manuscripts that we have of Polycarp's writings that kind of details the history of the text. And it's said to have been copied from a manuscript that was in the possession of Irenaeus, who is sort of the early to middle to late second century uh, writer that we'll get to as well. But the the document, one of the main documents we have for the martyrdom of Polycarp, is said to have been copied from writings belonging to Irenaeus. And Irenaeus is said to have <clears throat> actually... Um, known or or personally encountered Polycarp when he was a younger boy. So, either way, <clears throat> the text that we have uh, of the epistle to the Philippians is a text that um, is also available. You can find the text to... Um, the letter to the Philippians, the English translation that we're going to be reading in the Antonicene Fathers series. You can also find um, the martyrdom of Polycarp in that same series, but you can also find the martyrdom of Polycarp in a Greek translation or text uh, from which the English is, is done in the Loeb Classical Library series, Apostolic Fathers, Volume 2. Now, I'm going to be sharing with you two links to online translations of the martyrdom of Polycarp and Polycarp's letter to the Philippians. And I'm also going to be sharing with you a link to the Greek text of the letter to the Philippians. So you can get the Greek text to the letter or to, to the martyrdom of Polycarp in the Loeb Classical Library series. This probably you can even find online as well, the PDF Greek text of that document. And then, um, again, I have a link here. I'll put it in the description below for the Greek text of the letter by Polycarp to the Philippians. So, we'll go ahead and bring these up. We'll start with... A letter to the Philippians, 
that, like I said, was written probably somewhere around the middle of the second century CE. So Polycarp would have been around 55 to, to 75, right? Could have been fairly close to the end of his life, but it could have also been a little bit earlier, around 130 to 5, 140 CE. This is J.B. Lightfoot's translation that I'm going to be reading from. <clears throat> and let's just go ahead and take a look at the prologue here. And make sure you guys can see everything. Looks like it's it's pretty complete. You know, the way the text is at this online version, it doesn't allow for the text to really run across the screen and fill it up. So that's kind of as good as it'll little as it'll get. Excuse me, I could try to <clears throat> make it a little bigger. Let's see. See, it kind of compresses it even more. Makes it <clears throat> not readable. That's really, unless I want to go much smaller, that's kind of the best to me. But I'm going to put these links in the description below so you can read these online or you can look it up in the sources I've referenced earlier. Antonicene Fathers volume series or the J.B. Lightfoot series that I'm going to be reading from or the Loeb Classical Library edition of the Apostolic Fathers. So these editions are available for you to read in their entirety. I'm not going to read both documents in their entirety. I did that with Methetes' letter to Diognetus because it was one document. And if I were only reading one of these documents, I would read it all the way through. But it's not necessary really to do that. I'll do it if it's short enough. And I think the size of Methetes' letter to Diognetus is about as long of a read through as I'll do in this series. And this series is going to be about all the early Christian views, right? So pretty much everything pre Trinitarian. Have you seen anything Trinitarian in the video we did about Pliny's? letter to Trajan, where he references and describes what the Christians told him about their views, and how the Trinitarians have, of course, distorted that, but how it's really consistent with the biblical view and what we understand the biblical view to be. Have you seen any Trinitarianism in our video and discussion of Clement of Rome? Did you see any Trinitarianism in Methetes' letter to Diognetus? Well, I don't think you're going to see any Trinitarianism in the writings of Polycarp. And I'm going to present to you pretty much everything he writes where it concerns God, the Father, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit. So, and we'll look at a couple other things to get a well-rounded view. But um, we're not going to be encountering Trinitarianism for quite a while. And I think what I'm going to do is just reserve this series only for the pre-Trinitarian early Christian views of Jesus. is because it's going to be a while before we get to the Trinity. And then I'm going to deal with the Trinitarian, the, the, the explicitly Trinitarian writings, views, councils, and creeds as part of the Bible and the Trinity in Conflict series. So... Let's go ahead and take a look at Polycarp's letter to the Philippians. Let's just take a look at the opening statement in the prologue, where it says, Polycarp and the presbyters that are with him unto the church of God, which sojourneth at Philippi. Mercy unto you and peace from God Almighty and Jesus Christ our Savior, be multiplied. Now, no Trinitarians. This isn't a Grandfield Sharp construction. And even if it were, as I've explained and as I'm going to talk about later and, and as I've talked about before and as I will talk about further again, the comparisons that Daniel B. Wallace and others make, for example, in his doctoral thesis about uh, the Sharpest Rule or Sharp's Rule, basically, in his version of it, the, the examples he gives in his appendix for the most part, are not comparable. There are only a couple texts where there's a proper name used with other terms, which really aren't, in most cases, common terms. 
which you know is what we're supposed to be talking about when it comes to sharpshore right terms like brother and friend companion and brother something like that right whereas whereas what trinitarians like to do is get involved in the granville sharp discussion and say well these also apply this is similar to these christologically and theologically significant texts with terms like god father great god savior jesus christ right which actually have a proper name which Granville Sharp's rule doesn't apply to. I did this. It doesn't apply when there's a proper name involved, and yet the rule is constructed around these common noun applications, and then used to to try to argue for the application of the same terms that are significant theologically and christologically to the point of basically being proper names or applying monadically to one individual in a specific sense. I like proper names, or they actually have proper names. And so aren't comparable at all, right? There are a couple of texts where we have like, for example, God and Father, or the God and Father. They're both significant terms, are they not, when it comes to the one God, the Father? Even in John 8, the Jews, in one sense, God is, this, is the one Father. But in another sense, someone like Abraham can be their father, right? So when, when a, a text refers to God and Father, right? We all know who that is, right? The one God, the Father. Those terms are exclusive to him in that sense. Now, the term God can apply, like Jesus does to other individuals, John 10, 33-36, coins on too, but that doesn't change the weight of application, the signification when it's applied to the Father. So I just want to make that point, though, here. So Trinitarians, either way, there's this isn't a Granville Sharp construction here, but even if it were, as I've explained, I'm going to get to again, I'm kind of laying the groundwork because we have another text coming up where there is more of an application with Sharp's rule, although they, they often argue against it in that case. Not always. We'll see. You'll see. And some of you may know what I'm talking about. But in this case, look, Polycarp refers to whom? God Almighty. We saw that in Mathetes' letter to Diognetus as well, as well as referring to God in clear distinction between him and his son, right? By calling God not just the Almighty, but Pantoctistes, the All-Creator, right? And only he was called that. So we have here a clear distinction right out of the gate between God Almighty and and Jesus Christ, our Savior. Then if we go, remember, we're not reading the whole thing. I'm going to read a couple other sections at the end. But we're just going to focus on, on Christologically and theologically significant texts from the martyrdom of Polycarp and, as we're doing right now, Polycarp's letter to the Philippians, right around the middle of the, of the second century. So within a hundred years of, of living apostles. Let's take a look at Polycarp's letter to the Philippians, chapter 2, verse 1. <clears throat> Excuse me. In there it says, Wherefore, gird up your loins and serve God in fear and truth, forsaking the vain and empty talking and the error of the many, for that ye have believed on him that raised our Lord Jesus from the dead and gave unto him glory and a throne at his right hand, unto whom all things were made subject that are in heaven and that are on earth, and to whom every creature that has breath doeth service, who cometh as judge of quick and dead, whose blood goth God will require of them that are disobedient to him. What does this sound like? Right, this is very similar to Philippians chapter 2, 9 through 11, is it not? Look, it, right after Philippians talks about him you know, being in the form of a god, taking on the form of a man, right? Emptying himself. Although he was rich, he became poor. He became lower than the angels, lower than the gods, Trinitarians. Psalm 8, 5, 6, Hebrews 2, 7 through 9, last Adam, 1 Corinthians 15, 45. Trinitarians, it's time to align yourselves with the Bible, okay? And as we go through these early Christian views of Jesus, you, you align yourselves with them too. That's okay. It's better than where you are right now, as we're going to demonstrate 
although I don't want you Trinitarians to lose your faith. It's very important because even though I think it's false doctrine, I understand you know the difficulties that are involved at times with growing up a certain way or being around certain people or having really you know put a lot of effort and time and 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 spirit into becoming a Trinitarian. So it's really up to you, but 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 your doctrine is not in these writers, these early Christian writers. It, it's not in the Bible. We've shown that, right? You guys act like it's all over the place. It's like it's in the Old Testament, it's in the New Testament. It's not anywhere. One God the Father, that's what's there, right? Sons of God are gods, that's what's there. And then, then when we look, you know, and we're, we have a whole series going on that, okay? So I'm not just saying that, as we know. Now we're going through these early Christian writers, Trinitarians, and, and we're seeing the same things that we believe and that we get, of course, directly from the Bible, but that, that we also can now see well into the second century are consistent with what we've been telling you. Here, look, right right after Philippians 2, 6 through 9, talks about him taking the form of a man, as I, as I explained. Talks about him giving his life, right? And then being raised up. And as I told Dr. White during our debate, which he completely avoided by trying to claim, I split Jesus up in two persons, right? I brought up Philippians 2, 6 through 11. And I said, well, what's being, who's being exalted here? You say he has two natures and he's always been God, right? He's never ceased being God in total contradiction of the text I just referenced earlier. So how is he being exalted? He's already God, right? He, you can't be exalted to... And remember, this is an exaltation like praise. and This is being elevated to a position, a superior position he wasn't in. Hence, he's being elevated. Well, if he's already God and never stopped being God... And, and according to Dr. White during our debate, you can't split up the natures. It's one person. One person, right, James? Okay, one person. So he's being exalted as one person. But if he, would, he was already God as one person, why would he have to be exalted to a superior position? That's what I tried to explain to him, and I've been explaining ever since. And I'll continue to explain, because it makes no sense, Trinitarians. You are the ones who split up his natures, because you're ultimately forced to conclude that it's his human nature being elevated there. Just like you're forced to conclude, it's his human nature being given all authority. Matthew 28. But you don't want to conclude that in Philippians 2 because he's given the name above every name, right? And you like the parallel, the, 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 the not quotation, but use of similar language from Isaiah and say it's basically calling him Jehovah there. But it's, it's actually doing exactly the opposite, right? It's proving he's not Jehovah by first referring to Jehovah as the one who exalted him to a position that is one person. He was not in before. You can't split up the natures, James. One person, God already to you, not to us because he's been made lower than the angels. Hebrews 2. Last Adam, 1 Corinthians 15. So to us, it's easy. He's been made a life-giving spirit and exalted to God's right hand. Simple, done. Son of God, given the all the authority in heaven and on earth, sitting on God's throne. Christians get that too. Rule from heaven on God's throne. Revelation 3. So he was not God always. He couldn't have been because there would have then been no need to exalt him to a superior position. Doesn't get any higher than that, Dr. White. All due respect, uh, you're ignoring the point like you did last time. And there really is no way to address the point. You said it yourself. He's one person. So as one person, he's being exalted to a position he didn't have before. And if he was already God, he would already be in that position, both natures and all. 
you're the one who has to split them up to account for him receiving something that's inconsistent with what you say he already had, which would then be inconsistent with what Paul says he didn't already have, and which is consistent with Polycarp right here, which again says, God raised him from the dead and gave him glory. And as we know in Philippians 2, right, Jesus talks about receiving the glory that he had with the Father before the world was, just like John 1, 1 describes, in heaven, just like wisdom itself describes, Proverbs 8, 11 through 35, consistent with Micah 5, 1 through 4, which uses the same term referring to the goings forth or activity of the pre-human Messiah. So we can account for all of our beliefs biblically and the receiving of glory shows he didn't have that glory before Trinitarians. You say he always had it. He just veiled it. This doesn't say he unveiled it. It says he gave him glory, Trinitarians. That means he didn't have it. You see, giving something, that means they didn't have it. Uncovering something, yes, okay, that means unveiling. That's not what it says. So, again, this is being raised to a spirit in heaven. I'm going to show you, we'll talk more about that in a moment. But that's the glory he's receiving and the throne at his right hand, consistent again with everything we read in the biblical text. All these things were made subject to him because they weren't subject to him already. He wasn't God already. He gave up being a God or being in the form of God, like the other sons of God, to become a man, lower than those gods, those angels, and of course God. So your doctrine is refuted all over the place. It's not scriptural. It's a tradition you try to bring from out of place into these texts, and even into these early writers, and say, which is Trinity? No, no Trinity. One God the Father. Sons of God are gods who either represent their Father or who become their own gods, like Satan. All of this is consistent with the biblical text. Let's take a look at Polycarp's letter to the Philippians. Right, You can read all this on your own time. Right? There's just not a lot here. There's no Trinity anywhere. Right? <clears throat> and everything that, that would be against it that, it that is in that range of discussion. Right? Christology, theology. But you're welcome to read this on your own. And I think for the most part, you're going to see it's all consistent with what the Bible teaches. Now, when we get to the martyrdom of Polycarp, there's a couple things that I think we need to take a look at. But again, remember, the martyrdom of Polycarp while said to have been originally in the possession of Irenaeus, was copied by an individual named Gaius, and then it was later copied uh, by another individual, and I think even one time after that. Nevertheless, it is consistent with Eusebius's account, with Irenaeus's um, texts, and so... The, the actual, and the note that's in one of the manuscripts that we have. So we have a lot of manuscript history and, and references to use to authenticate these documents. <clears throat> but some of them were copied or added to a little bit later. One of our texts of the Martyrdom of Polycarp has Latin text added to chapters 10 through 12, I think, 10 through 12 and 14. And you're going to see one reference that I think clearly shows, you know, either things were coming off the rails in some respects in the mid to latter part of the second century, or these later copyists and people who made some changes or additions um, added some, what came about much later, at least, and may, again, may be represented here earlier, and that is veneration of saints. You'll see what I mean. <clears throat> Let's uh, first finish up with the letter to the Philippians, chapter 12, verse 2. Now, may the God and Father, 
of our Lord Jesus Christ and the eternal, that is a use of ionios, which as we have proven in many discussions of New Testament texts and Old Testament texts, does not mean eternal, like always going back for backwards and always going forward. It just means ongoing. But it's often translated eternal. So it confuses people. But you have to know what word is being used and then be able to um, look it up and make sure, right? So I have the Greek text of the letter to the Philippians right here. So if we go down to chapter 12, verse 2, now, in this case, we have it, I only have it on the Latin text. So remember, I said that parts of this chapter have been, have been added in Latin. Yeah, 10 through 12. So I think there is another source we can look at here. Again, I'll put these links down below. Let's see if I can get... Uh, See if we can get the Greek text. So it's again, it's in Latin here once again. This is another um, uh, link to another version of the of the text of the letter to the Philippians. I thought it might contain um, one of the of Greek manuscripts if it had this portion, but it looks like it's just in Latin. So we'll return. I'll leave the Greek there for now with that Latin. But according to the translation in Lightfoot, the representation given in this part of Polycarp's letter to the Philippians, even though it's associated with a Latin text that may or may not be original, it clearly refers to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which is exactly what the New Testament letters frequently open up with and sometimes close with. Romans 15, um, 1 through 5 would be an example, I believe, 1 through 6. And the openings of many other epistles, right? So this is entirely consistent with what we read in the Bible. The term eternal can have different meanings, right? If it's not ionios in the Latin term, we would have to look into that. But again, there, there, this sense of eternal would have to be consistent with what else we read in terms of this letter, and clearly in calling Jesus, the God and Father of Jesus, referring to the Father in that way, that shows that there is superiority. One is the God of the other, okay? There's no Trinitarianism, right? There's no one God in three persons. There's one God, the Father, who is the God of the other person. It's that simple. And Eternal, I believe, is consistent with Ionios' use of the Son in terms of the ongoingness of his existence since his resurrection. He was dead and was made alive by the Father. God cannot die, according to Habakkuk chapter 1. The Son actually died. He was not a God-man. His divine nature did not live on Trinitarians. He gave that up. Philippians 2, 6 through 9. John 1, 1 through 14. Doesn't say he became a God man. It says he became flesh. It says he became a man. It says he was the last Adam. So when he died, Trinitarians, he was out of existence. Something that can't happen to God. His spirit returned to the God who gave it. So in existence, what I mean by out of existence, he wasn't conscious. He was sleeping with the Father until the Father gave him his spiritual new body that is described for us in Revelation chapter 1, verses 12 through 16. And yet you continue to tell us that Jesus is in heaven with a bunch of wounds in his hands and feet. That's not what John describes in Revelation 1, 12 through 16. You're confusing his earthly manifestation after he raised his body, right? break down this temple and in three days I'll raise it up. He had already been resurrected at that point, as I've explained previously. The Father's the one who raised him from the dead. 
just like we read earlier from Polycarp. Right? In 2.1. Him that raised our Lord Jesus Christ from the dead and gave unto him glory and a throne on his right hand. All consistent with the biblical accounts of Philippians 2, 9 through 11, and Revelation 2 through 3. Chapters 2 through 3. And the Latin text here of Polycarp 12 2, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, and we understand eternal consistent with the Bible as ongoing forward, especially in the context of what we just read in Polycarp's letter to Philippians chapter 2, verse 1, where God the Father raised him up and made him alive. So we know eternal here does not mean eternal the way you say it does, because that's all you can do, right? Or you could just be honest and say that it means everlasting, right? Deathlessness. We'll just say eternal in that sense for now. Eternal high priest himself, the Son of God, Jesus Christ, build you up in faith and truth and in all gentleness and all avoidance of wrath, forbearance, long-suffering, and in patient endurance and in purity. May he grant unto you a lot and portion among his saints and to you and to us with you and to all that are under heaven who shall believe on our Lord and God, Jesus Christ, and on his Father that raised him from the dead. Now here... You, it, it appears that we have a reference to him as God, right? So right, and this is, remember, this is in the Latin text that, as I already explained, is not, is, is likely an, a later edition. So we have him, we have this, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And then we have, who shall believe on our Lord and God Jesus Christ and on his father that raised him from the dead. Now, this to me is not a problem at all. Why would it be? I believe exactly what we're told in John 20, 28. And even though I don't believe texts like 2 Peter 1, 1 or Titus 2, 13 related to the Sharps rule issue we were talking about earlier, I don't believe those apply both terms to Jesus or apply God or great God to Jesus because of it could, but just like in regular, in other texts where there's not an issue, that's what I mean by regular, where it says the God and Father, right? So those to me are two terms of, of, of more than common signification. And yet they apply to one individual, which is fine. That can happen. But it can also be the case that terms of such high signification can apply to different individuals especially when we're dealing with different individuals of such high signification where one is essentially the other in certain contexts, right? And so, to me, this is entirely consistent, especially when you, right, this is like John chapter 20, like we discussed in our Bible in the Trinity and Conflict series. John twenty seventeen, Jesus tells us who is what? His God and our God. His Father and our Father. And then Thomas calls him my Lord and my God af right after he tells us that. He had earlier told everybody that when you see him, when you hear him, it's not him. He's telling us what the Father wants him to do. The Father's actually in him, working. It's not even his words, not his teaching. And that is entirely consistent with how the angels, the sons of God, including, in our view, the Son of God, is presented in the Old Testament as the one in whom God put his name, the angel of Exodus chapter 23, and throughout the account involving the Hebrews and their release from Egypt and thereafter. And even earlier before that with uh, different servants of Jehovah. We believe that the angels acted in the exact same way that, that they also act in the New Testament and that Jesus acts, in, whether it's in Revelation with the angels speaking both for Jesus and God, as Jesus and as God, or whether it's Jesus speaking as his Father, exactly like he tells us he's doing. You see, Trinitarians, 
it would be one thing if he never said, you know, I'm just God, right? See, Trinitarians, when they say, well, is Jesus God? What they mean by that is, is he a divine person, right? They don't mean, is he an individual God? Like one God, the Father, one individual God. They never mean that when it, I've told you guys this many times, right? But it's, <laughs> you're going to have to deal with this ongoingly because they don't have a choice. See, when, if they ask you, if they ever say, well, is the Father God? You have to ask them what they mean. If you answer that question without understanding what they mean, you just lost, right? Because they're just going to explain to you what they meant and you already answered in the affirmative to it. You have to say, well, what do you mean by God? Do you mean an individual God? Like a singular being? Is the Father a singular being God? Yes. Will Trinitarians agree with that? No, right? So you already know they're not using that word the way you are, the way the Bible uses it. Like when it talks about someone being the God of another person, it's so obvious they're not that individual being or sharing the same essence of being, right? Well, but Trinitarians believe it is. So when they say, is Jesus God? They don't mean an individual God, capital or lowercase g. They mean he's a divine person sharing the essence of being that is the Godhead. That is the, the, the one being of God. They, that's exactly what they mean But when they say the Holy Spirit is God. They don't mean an individual spirit God or divine being separate from the Father. They're connected in their essence and only divisible in their person. That's why the term face, prosopon, pene, that I discussed in our text reading yesterday on Psalm 10, 11, and 15. And I'm going to talk about more in a Bible in the Training Conflict series on the plural of majesty, quote unquote, and the use of prosopon or pene. Right? Outside of very clear, intensive plural uses for pene, which are never translated in the plural for the singular subject God in the Greek Septuagint, or ever used of God in the plural in the New Testament. It's always singular, the face, the prosopon of God. Right? He's an individual being. That's what we mean when we say Jesus is our Lord and God. He's an individual God, a son of God, the son of God, Trinitarians, who is representing the Father to us. He's on the Father's throne. Remember, we read that from the non-spurious part of, Philippi, of his letter to the Philippians chapter 2, verse 1, right here. Raised Jesus from the dead and gave him glory and a throne on his right hand and everything was made subject to him. By God Almighty, from the prologue, the way the Father's described. So, even though this section, this Latin section, this is consistent, both of these, right? It's like John chapter 20 to me. It's not saying anything any different because we accept Jesus as our Lord and God and as the Father. Right? That's why he's our Lord and God, because he's the Father to us. The Father has made him Lord to us. Acts 2.36, he's sitting on the Father's throne, telling us what the Father has told him, using the authority the Father gave to him. You think he's acting any differently than the Father would? No, he's not. And that's why it's okay. This is where Trinitarians not only fail to understand the metaphysics, they fail to understand why it's not a problem, right? Why it's not a polytheistic problem or issue. They're all representing one God, the Father. His Father, just like it says right there, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And that's the Lord and God that Jesus is to us. 
All right, that's pretty much it from Polycarp's letter to the Philippians. No Trinity in there. The, the highest level we got, which is what we already accept, a John 20, 17, and 28 level of association between the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ and Jesus as our Lord and God. These are things we already believe are expressly taught in the accepted New Testament documents, and we understand them exactly as the Bible presents the sons of God as gods, the oi, and as God, the Father, to us. Which is why angels are identified as the God that spoke to Moses in Acts chapter 5, according to Acts chapter 5, when the when God spoke to him out of the burning bush and when he gave him the law, right? So, and then we can point to other accounts as I've done in other videos. This is all consistent with biblical theology. We don't need later Trinitarian traditions to understand these things. This is entirely consistent so far with biblical theology. All right, let's go now to the martyrdom of Polycarp. And I've got with me the... Um, the same edition I'm going to be reading from, the Web Classical Library, Apostolic Fathers, Volume 2, by Cursop Blake. This is the online edition I'll be reading from, and I'll be referencing the Greek text um, occasionally. I'll put the links again to these below. I don't; They're not there now, but I will put them there. We're not going to read the whole thing, but I encourage you to do so. These are great documents. There's really not, there's only a couple things that I would say are potentially based on other things. And again, even that section that I was just discussing from Polycarp chapter 12, the letter to the Philippians, is the later section, the Latin section that was added. But either way, it's consistent. So where it's not consistent, we'll point that out. Where, where things in these early Christian writers are not consistent, and I have one coming up. It's not too significant, certainly not in relation to this, the Trinity subject, but we're not here to just approve everything we read, right? Sometimes we may have text issues. Sometimes we may have explicit errors in theology or Christology. So far, I haven't seen anything. So far, whether it's Pliny the Younger's letter to Trajan, whether it's Clement of Rome, whether it's Methetes, whether it's Polycarp, I'm finding really nothing but what's consistent with biblical theology and Christology. And there's nothing involving the Trinity. And there's not going to be for quite some time. We'll keep going, though. All right, martyrdom of Polycarp. If you look at the opening here, what is referred to as chapter zero, it says, the church of God which sojourns in Smyrna, to the church of God which sojourns in Philomelium, and to all the sojournings of the Holy Catholic Church in every place, mercy, peace, and love of God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ be multiplied. So again, you have a similar opening to what we read in, in the letter to the Philippians and in what we see in the New Testament. Clear separation between God and Jesus. And when it says Catholic Church, you know, that's not the Roman Catholic Church that, that we have. Today, this is more just the church in a universal sense. And let me just for one moment take a look. I haven't, I don't think I haven't greeted everybody. I wanted to do that. So, GL, good to see you. Thank you again. Betsy, pleasure to have you. Brandon, good to see you. Bankhead, Henry, Pink Moon, all of you, thanks for joining the discussion. Thank you also, Henry, for the super chat. All right, so let's get back to the martyrdom of Polycarp. All right, so that's the opening salutation. And then if we go to chapter 2, let's go ahead and read. Uh, let's see. We'll read um, We'll read the whole whole part whole part here just to give a little more context and um you know so we don't go too fast 
Blessed then and noble are all the martyrdoms which took place according to the will of God, for we must be very careful to assign the power of our all to God. Now again, Polycarp was martyred in 155, 156, depending on the intercalation of the Asian calendar uh, and the and the references to individuals in the martyrdom of Polycarp, 155 to 156. Polycarp was 86 years old when he was martyred, putting him to, in my count, about 75 CE when he was born. And then this account was probably written sometime after he was born, between 160 and 200, right? Because Irenaeus is said to have had a copy of this. And he lived until about 200. So it would have had to have been written before then. All right, so let's get back to it. Chapter 2, starting verse 1. Blessed then and noble are all the martyrdoms which took place according to the will of God. For we must be very careful to assign the power of our all to God. For who would not admire their nobility and patience and love of their master? For some were torn by scourging until the mechanism of their flesh was seen even to the lower veins and arteries, talking about the extreme torture of the Christians. And they endured so that even the bystanders pitied them and mourned. And some even reached such a pitch of nobility that none of them groaned or wailed, showing to us all that at that hour of their torture, the noble martyrs of Christ were absent from the flesh, or rather that the Lord was standing by and talking with them. Verse 3, this is the key part. And pay need to the grace of Christ, they despised worldly tortures by a single hour, purchasing everlasting life. And the fire of their cruel tortures had no heat for them. And they set before their eyes an escape from the fire, which is everlasting and is never quenched. With the eyes of their heart, they looked up to the good things, which are preserved for those who have endured, which neither ear hath heard nor eye hath seen, nor hath it entered into the heart of man. But it was shown by the Lord to them that were no longer men, but already angels. And this is significant because it shows very clearly the biblical teaching is not like Trinitarians claim. Trinitarians not only claim that Jesus has two natures, his human nature and his divine nature, but that we will also have our human and our divine nature. But that's not what the Bible teaches. It teaches that we will actually release ourselves from what is corruptible, the flesh. And our spirit returns to God who gives us a new spiritual body like he did Jesus. Like I referenced earlier, and I've talked about numerous times. Here, the teaching in Polycarp, or in the martyrdom of Polycarp, is that those Christians who died became angels, right? Which we know, according to the Hebrews and the book of Psalms, are spirits. He makes his angels spirits, flames of fire. So there's, there's no teaching anywhere in the early Christian writers, either Trinitarians, of this two natures stuff you're talking about. That's just false doctrine. It's certainly not biblical or early Christian doctrine. Not yet. And the express teaching is that the Christians, when they die, basically become spirits, right? Become angels. That's what the angels are. They're spirits. Okay. Let's go now to chapter 9. And again, you can read this entirely on your own, but there's just not a whole lot of very explicit theological or Christological descriptions that we can use to say, okay, this is how they viewed them. Now, we've had enough so far, I think, to show clearly that Polycarp's letter to the Philippians and so far the martyrdom of Polycarp are consistent with the Bible when it comes to God and Jesus and the condition or the type of being that we become after we die. All right, chapter 9. Let's go ahead and we'll just read the whole thing here, 1 through 3. Let me see if I can get that whole thing in there for you on the visual. That's a little better.
Well, you can always check the link. There's just a little part that's cut off on the screen that I can see, but pretty much you can see what's there. It says, Now, when Polycarp entered into the arena, there came a voice from heaven. Be strong, Polycarp, and play the man. And no one saw the speaker. But our friends who were there heard the voice. And next he was brought forward. And there was a great uproar of those who heard that Polycarp had been arrested. Verse 2, therefore he was brought forward. When he was brought forward, the proconsul asked him if he were Polycarp. And when he admitted it, he tried to persuade him to deny, saying, respect your age, and so forth, as they are accustomed to say, swear by the genius of Caesar, repent, and say, away with the atheists. Referring to the Christians. This is the proconsul talking to Polycarp. But then Polycarp, with a stern countenance, looked on all the crowd of lawless heathen in the arena, waving his hand at them. He groaned and looked up to heaven and said, away with the atheists, right? So instead of doing it to the Christians, he did it to the the non-Christians. Verse 3, but when the proconsul pressed him and said, take the oath and I let you go, revile Christ. Polycarp said, for 80 and 6 years have I been his servant and he has done me no wrong. And how can I blaspheme my king who saved me? I wanted to read this part. Do you remember I said we'd read some other sections just so you get a good sense of what we're, what we're reading, right? What, what type of document, what type of person was Polycarp? What is said to have happened with him? And as you can see, everything that is being taught in association with him, either in his letter to the Philippians or here in the, the martyrdom account, There's nothing that's inconsistent with the Bible. He's representing Christianity in one of the most admirable ways you can imagine, right? Standing firm in front of a hostile crowd and an official trying to get you to break your faith, to revile the Messiah. And they're going to kill you anyway, right? It's not like you're going to live and just be, it's not like you're going to get forever life. No, this is just a trick, everybody. They just try to use what we all want, and that is life, but they're not going to give that to you anyway. They just want you to to die disgraceful. But Polycarp did not do that, right? He had the right, what what has Christ done to me? Right? You want me to revile someone who's done nothing to me? That made me a better person? That I believe fulfilled all these ancient prophecies and is God's son? How about no? How about I don't think so? Because I know what you're going to do as soon as I'm done. Chapter 10. All right, so it goes on. But when he persisted again and said, swear by the genius of Caesar, Polycarp answered him, if you vainly suppose that I will swear by the genius of Caesar, as you say, and pretend that you are ignorant who I am, listen plainly. I am a Christian. Now, this is an example of what we have in John 1 1, right? We have in John 1 1 an anarthrous predicate nominative preceding the verb. The Trinitarians completely misrepresent, right? And try to define in a way that doesn't actually indicate what the text is telling us that he's a God in association with the God who was in the beginning when God the Father was with the sons of God. Right? They try to create this Trinitarianism, right? Because they can't have him be God, right? They can't have the word be the Trinity. They can't have him be God the Father. And so they just reinterpret God to mean person of God. I talked about this in my John 1 1 discussion in the Bible and the Tree and Conflict series, and in my John 1 1 Made Easy video, and in my writings, of course, and debates. There's really no way out, Trinitarians. Theos there means a God. Right here, we have in Polycarp chapter 10, right? This is very common. When you front a term that I, I talk about fronting in my discussion of this issue, you're just adding emphasis, right? You're just putting it before the verb 
so that it's noticed first, so that it's emphasized. You're not transforming it into this qualitative noun that isn't definite or definite, right? It's not just talking about the nature of what the noun is. It's, it's applying the noun and the nature along with it. And it's being emphasized by it being placed before the verb. That's it. It makes no difference. And in contrast with hotheos, the proper translation is a god, just like Origen teaches. Because he's clearly not that god, not just the person that you redefine that god to be, because of your later doctrine. You don't have to do that, Trinitarians. Biblical theology. Christianus emi. Anarthrus predicate nominative preceding the verb. I am a Christian. The word was a God. With God. The only begotten God. Who came to explain God that no one has seen. Trinitarians. John 1.18 this construction is actually very common. It almost always involves either a definite or indefinite sense. In fact, it always does that I can see. And Trinitarians just try to disassociate the qualities from the definite or indefinite application of the noun and basically turn it into an adjective like divine so they can read their theology into the text. We don't need to do that. We just interpret the text according to the context and overall understanding and belief that they had at this time and preceding this time leading up to these events. But I wanted to highlight this because this is an example of, of the same construction we have in John 1.1. 1, 1. C, an Arthur's predicate nominative preceding the verb, most naturally translated as a Christian. He's an example of what is a Christian. The word is an example of what is a God being one of the sons of God who are gods according to that God and God. Psalm 82, John 10. So, keep that in mind. Now, let's take a look at chapter 14. We'll read verses 1 through 3. So they did not nail him, but bound him because they're going to they're going to burn him alive. He had a dream. If you read the account, the martyrdom of Polycarp, Polycarp had a dream of a, a pillow burning. And he understood that to mean he would be burned alive. And he faced it confidently, according to the account, right? He, he knew what was coming. And of course, like we see with Daniel in the lion's den, or with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, right? And I mean, None of us want to be tortured or experience extreme pain, do we? But we don't really know what's going to happen, right? Jehovah, the spirits, the son of, they're right there with us. You don't think they'd be there with us at the worst possible time? That's when they would be there the most. All we have to do is have faith. We may not experience anything at all. It might be all just something we think we get too scared. We don't have faith. Well, according to the account, Polycarp had faith. And it says, and he put his hands behind him and was bound as a noble ram out of a great flock for an oblation, a whole burnt offering made ready and acceptable to God. It's talking about Polycarp. And he looked up to heaven and said, O Lord God Almighty, just like we read in his letter to the Philippians, in direct contrast with Jesus, he does it again. O Lord God Almighty, Father of thy beloved and blessed child, Pais, just like we read is applied to Jesus in the book of Acts, God's child Trinitarians, his huias, his son, his prototikos, the firstborn one which according to the Bible means he's the beginning of God's generative power, Deuteronomy 21, 17. And we know he is the beginning. He's called that not only in Proverbs 8, but also Revelation 3, 14. The beginning of the creation by God. Consistently presented throughout the New Testament and in the early Christian writings so far. Through whom, O Lord God Almighty, Father of thy beloved, blessed child, Jesus Christ, through whom 
we have received full knowledge of thee, the God of angels and powers, and of all creation, of the whole family of the righteous, who live before thee. I bless thee that thou hast granted me this day and hour that I may share among the number of the martyrs in the cup of thy Christ. It's Polycarp. He's talking to God as he's about to be put to death. For the resurrection to everlasting life, both of the soul and body, in the immortality of the Holy Spirit. And may I today be received among thee, among them before thee, as a rich and acceptable sacrifice, as thou, the God who lies not and who is truth, has prepared beforehand and shown forth and fulfilled. For this reason I also praise you, or praise thee for all things. I bless thee, I glorify thee through the everlasting and heavenly high priest. Right? See here, the translation is everlasting. And we had earlier uh, eternal. And I believe that was in the, um, yes, in the Latin later section of the letter to the Philippians chapter 12, verse 2. It first referred to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ and then called him the eternal high priest. But in Latin, right? And later, here in the martyrdom of Polycarp, we get the translation everlasting and heavenly high priest. Now, if we take a look at chapter 14 in the same edition that I'm reading from right here online in the actual book form. Chapter 14 of the martyrdom of Polycarp and verse 3, it says on page, let's see here. 332, 333, the English translation, the everlasting and heavenly high priest, Jesus Christ, tu Ioniu kai epauraniu archie, archie reos Jesu Christu. I told you, Ionios, which does not mean eternal always going backward and forward. It can mean like from everlasting to everlasting when it talks about God in that way in the Psalms. That's not what it, it's describing here or most everywhere else, especially when it's talking about people who are not God or eternal. They're his son. They're his firstborn, right? It doesn't have to mean eternal and it usually does not. It just means continuous going forward from a particular point. In Jesus' case, usually his resurrection, right? That's when he became high priest. Thy beloved child through whom be glory to thee with him and the Holy Spirit, both now and for the ages that are to come. Right? And we don't have a problem with that at all. We, we both accept that the Holy Spirit can be personalized as God's spirit, which it almost always is. Or it can actually be a separate spirit, like one of the seven spirits before God's throne, that send greetings along with God and Jesus, right? It's very interesting. So they may all be referred to as the Holy Spirit and only perform the function of being the Holy Spirit, whatever it is that God the Father sends them forth to do. Or Jesus, now that he's received it, right? Because he's received the promised Holy Spirit from the Father, according to the book of Acts. So since being raised to his right hand, which is exactly what we're talking about right here. So whether it's the Holy Spirit as one of those spirits, a separate spirit. It's, there's no trinity. That doesn't make him part of the trinity. In fact, referring to the seven spirits, if that's the Holy Spirit, or those spirits are, are the Holy Spirit when they act, that means they're separate spirits, right? They're presented as seven spirits, separate from God, the one who is, who was, and who is coming, and separate from Jesus Christ, the one to whom God gave a revelation. So, we do not have anything Trinitarian here. We don't have a problem, especially when it says, glory be to thee with him and the Holy Spirit, right? We baptize people in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And while there may be some question as to the original, original reading in Matthew 28, the fact is, we accept that. We don't have a problem recognizing the Holy Spirit as, either as a real separate person from God the Father and the Son, 
or as God the Father's actual spirit that is personalized, that acts in a personalized way, and that is usable and something he can send to accomplish his will. Right? It's metaphysic in ways that are beyond our understanding experientially, so we can only go based on what we have in the text. And they're called spirits. It's a spirit, Holy Spirit. God is a spirit. The Son is resurrected a spirit. They're separate spirits, Trinitarians. They're not separate persons in one God, Trinitarians. That's nowhere communicated anywhere in the Epistle to the Philippians by Polycarp or the Martyrdom. Let's take a look now at chapter 17. We're getting close to the end. Verse 1, chapter 17, But the jealous and envious evil one who resists the family of the righteous, when he saw the greatness of his martyrdom and his blameless career from the beginning, and that he was crowned with the crown of immortality, and had carried off the unspeakable prize, took care that not even his poor body should be taken away by us, though many desired to do so, and to have fellowship with his flesh. Right, this is the part that I mentioned or alluded to earlier that I think represents a concern or potentially something added later, um, or that may have begun, right? Because at this point, Right, where mar the the martyrdom has occurred. He's talking about his flesh, right, and how people wanted to have fellowship with his flesh after he died, right. So it's kind of it doesn't strike me as is as a Christian teaching, right. It strikes me as something more developing along the lines of a veneration of the saints, of people now in the middle, going into the latter part of the second century, starting to develop this high level of veneration, this inappropriate veneration for individuals that did definitely deserve to be looked to as represent, representatives of the Christ, right? They, they should be acknowledged for, for dying faithful in these ways. But venerating their flesh, wanting to fellowship with their dead flesh, I think that's getting carried away at this point, right? So there are signs of things breaking down or changing in ways that, that ultimately don't lead to what is good. We see that in the New Testament too, right? It's not like this is the first time something like this started to happen. Something that is against what is the tradition of the apostles and from the Christ. So we just need to know this, right? We need to know when and where and in what documents and where in those documents there might be things that don't represent, they may represent early Christian views, right? This may represent what Christians were understanding or wanted to do in the middle to second, latter part of the second century. That doesn't mean it's right though, okay? So I wouldn't start having fellowship with people's flesh, even if they die faithful and you consider them a, a, a genuine Christian uh, follower of Christ. That's not what we're taught in the New Testament. Therefore, he put forward Nikitas, the father of Herod and the brother of Alci, to ask the governor not to give his body, lest he said they leave the crucified one, meaning Jesus, and begin to worship this man, meaning Polycarp. And they said this owing to the suggestions and pressure of the Jews, who also watched when we were going to take it from the fire, for they did not know that we shall ever be able to either abandon the Christ, who suffered for the salvation of those who are being saved in the whole world, innocent for sinners, or to worship any other. Verse 3, For him we worship as the Son of God, but the martyrs we love as disciples and imitators of the Lord, and rightly because of their unsurpassable affection toward their own king and teacher, God grant me that we too may be their companions and fellow disciples. Right? So right here, we worship as we worship him as the Son of God. And now the the verb used here, you could verify this, of course, as just look in the text of the Lord Classical Library, I already have. 
it's proskuneo, which is a term used frequently, not just for Jesus in the New Testament, but for individuals throughout the Old Testament. It says in Hebrews 1 that God lets all his angels worship him as he brings his firstborn into the inhabited earth. Worship in the sense of honor, fall down, and 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 I guess worship in the sense of rep, of acknowledging the position of the individual, whether that's a king, an angel, the son of God, or God, or Christians, right? Because as I've discussed before, in Revelation 3, 9, Jesus says he's going to make people come and worship before his followers' feet, proskuneo. So again, worship is really not the right term. Worship tends to make people think only of God. But in Christian teaching, Jesus and the Christians sit on God's throne and represent God, at least for the thousand years. So they effectively become God to us in that sense. They're not the one God. They're sons of God who represent him and only do his will and teach what he wants to be taught, what authority he wants to be enforced. So worship is probably is really not the right term here unless you're comfortable with that term in the relative sense that it's allowed because of Jesus being given the authority and position to act as God to us, right? It's not worship going to him that takes away from the glory of God the Father, right? Philippians chapter 2 verses 9 through 11 explicitly describes the elevation of Jesus to a, a higher position he didn't already have. Wasn't a God-man. Sorry. That's over, Trinitarians. Elevated to a higher position than he already had, and every knee bows before him, and every tongue, tongue openly acknowledges him as Lord. That's quote-unquote worship, is it not? That's more worship than you see demonstrated to him in the New Testament, bowing down before him, falling to the ground, just like you see given to people in the Old Testament, just like Christians receive in the New Testament. So this is not worship in the ultimate sense. And in Philippians 2, 9 through 11, where it describes pretty much everybody bowing down to him and acknowledging him as Lord, it's done to whose glory? The Father. So again, that reinforces that you're only supposed to give it to the Father. That's all it's going to through him. When you worship Jesus, when you call Jesus my Lord, my God, when you bow before him and acknowledge him as Lord, you are doing so to the glory of God the Father. If you're following the Bible, if you're not following the Bible and you're following the Trinity or something else, well, well, then that's different. We follow the Bible. And so far, it looks like these early Christian writers and sources are following or representing what is in the Bible as well. And none of them are teaching anything consistent with the Trinity. Let's continue because we're almost at the end. Chapter 19. Chapter 19. Verses 1 through 1 and 2. Such was the lot of the blessed Polycarp, who, though he was, together with those from Philadelphia, the twelfth martyr in Smyrna, is alone especially remembered by all, so that he is spoken of in every place, even by the heathen. He was not only a famous teacher, but also a notable martyr, whose martyrdom all desired to imitate, for it followed the gospel of Christ. By his endurance, he overcame the unrighteous ruler and thus gained the crown of immortality. This is what I'm referring to earlier when I was saying Ionios referring to him as the high priest everlastingly, not eternal in the sense of both directions always, right? That's what Trinitarians want. That's not what it means. And it clearly is talking about him gaining that right here. After he died and was resurrected not always having it. 
and he is glorifying God and the Almighty Father. That's the third time we've had that reference in the Polycarp writings and the writing of Methetes to Diognetus. And it's always the Father, Trinitarians, just like in the Bible. Rejoicing with the apostles and all the righteous, and he is blessing our Lord Jesus Christ, the Savior of our souls, the Governor of our bodies, and the Shepherd of the Catholic Church, universal Christianity, the Christians throughout the world, as it says, throughout the world. So nothing at all wrong here, right? Again, God the Father, God Almighty, blessing our Lord Jesus Christ, Savior of our souls. Let's now take a look at chapter 20. You indeed ask that the events should be explained to you at length, but we have for the present explained them in summary by our brother Marcion. Therefore, when you have heard these things, send the letter to the brethren further on. And that's not talking about the famous heretic Marcion, as the note here explains. And send the letter to the brethren further on, that they also may glorify the Lord, who takes his chosen ones from his servants, and to him who is able to bring us all in grace and bounty to his heavenly kingdom, and by his only begotten child, Managanes, Trinitarians, and Pais, used together right here, both clearly denoting temporality, just like they do in the New Testament. Be glory, honor, might, and majesty forever. Greet the saints, those who are with us, and Everestus, who wrote the letter, with his whole house. Greet you. And then we have uh, this item here. It's described as notes by a later scribe, chapter 22. This is the final part. We bid you Godspeed, brethren, who walk according to the gospel and the word of Jesus Christ, with whom be glory to God and Father and the Holy Spirit. And this is a text that is in direct conflict with Granville Sharp's rule. I cite it in my writings, and it was cited by Calvin Winstanley as well. And it shows basically what we're talking about when we discuss this issue as it relates to Granville Sharp's rule in the New Testament. And that is that the examples that Dr. Wallace gives in his thesis and later published work on this subject are for the most part not comparable. There are a couple texts in the New Testament where it says something like the apostle and high priest Jesus, where again you have both terms applied to an individual with a proper name used. Similar to texts like the God and Father, both terms having an, a monadic reference to the one God and Father of Christianity, but also in other respects being capable of applying to others, but not in the same sense, both applying to one individual there. So that can happen. But it can also be the case that when you have a term like the great God or God and Father or God, right? God is used exclusively of the Father in the Pauline writings as, as apart from controversial texts, right? So it's 100%. One God, the Father. There's an exclusive monadic sense in which God applies to the Father and no one else. So how can you say when it's applied to him in that sense several hundred times and no one else that it's not a proper name or the equivalent thereof, right? We know who it's talking about. Sometimes there might be a question, like John 20, 28, or like we read earlier, but in the writings of Polycarp, but in John 20 and in the writings of Polycarp, it's preceded by referring to the God and Father of Jesus. So we know it's talking about him representing that God as God to us, like the other sons of God have done prior to him. And like he tells us he's doing explicitly in texts like John 8, John 7, John 12, John 14. Right? So this is not something unarticulated. It's everywhere. It just doesn't agree with Trinitarian tradition. Either way, the Granville Sharps rule which doesn't take into account the fact, again, the signification of terms. Sometimes, look, for example, Wallace does. And, and in fact, in this text, some Wallace will say maybe the terms are basically carry the weight of a proper name. It, he would also agree with that, I think, in texts like Ephesians 5.5, 5, kingdom of God and Christ, right? Terms like Christ, God, Savior, Lord. These can carry the weight of proper names, especially when they're used of individuals in a monadic or exclusive sense, right? Who's the one Lord of Christians? Well, Jesus, right? So Lord basically carries the weight of a proper name, whether it uses his name or not. But then we have 
titles or descriptions that are, for example, usually exclusively of the Father, the great God in Titus 2.13, used together with another term, Savior, but also with a proper name, Jesus Christ. It's totally different from most of the examples given in Wallace's appendix that are alleged to be parallels to these Christologically and theologically significant texts, but they're not. They're not only not significant in terms of the weight of the noun signification, right? The significance, the semantic weight and application of a particular individual that's not applicable to anyone else, and hence not a common noun. But they're also different in most cases, right? Again, a couple examples also use proper names that can that do apply both nouns to one individual. That can happen. But the pool of examples shrinks dramatically when you account for the inclusion of a proper name and then, of course, of nouns with clearly the weight of proper names or signification far beyond common nouns, like brother and friend, right? Companion. Those are not the same as God, Lord, Savior, Christ, let alone when used with terms with actual proper names. Yet they're all combined together in this sharp fool discussion. Well, here in the martyrdom of Polycarp, in the Greek text that you can look up yourself in the Loeb Classical Library edition, it talks about, it refers to in a Granville Sharp Rule construction, God and Father and Holy Spirit, Totheo Kai Patri Kai Hagio Numati. So if we're going to follow Sharp's rule, then this would apply all of these terms to one individual, identifying the Father with the Holy Spirit. God and Father and Holy Spirit, with the article only preceding the first of the nouns in a Kai Join uh, sequence. So, and some Trinitarians like Wallace will even suggest that maybe early on that the Christians like Polycarp or the people that wrote the martyrdom of Polycarp, or at least this later scribe, did believe that the Father and the Holy Spirit were the same, right? Just had a heretical view of the of the issue. And then some, or in Wallace as well, will suggest it's also possible, again, these terms carry the semantic weight of a proper name. And some examples, like I said, the Christologically significant ones in the New Testament, 2 Peter 1, 1, Titus 2, 13, they not only carry terms with the equivalent semantic weight of these terms here, theos, Father, Holy Spirit, Patri, Hagio, Numati. Well, if you're going to say those terms carry the weight of a proper name, so there'd be no confusion about who the Father is and who the Holy Spirit is, and I agree, that's our argument. That's our whole point, that certain nouns carry the weight of proper names because they're of their semantic attachment, of their monadic association with specific individuals that is not applicable to anyone else in that sense. And so people know who we're talking about. The only possible confusion that can happen at times is between God the Father and Jesus, but because that's because one is representing the other. And sometimes we're not sure who they're referring to because the title God can exclusively apply to the Father, but also to the Son as he represents him. Nowhere near the same extent or in the same way, but we have to account for that. Trinitarians are just looking for a way to read the Trinity back into the Bible. So if they can get a text that calls the Son God or the Holy Spirit God, that's all they care about. Because when they say God, they mean divine nature, person of God who shares in that nature of being. They don't mean an individual God, capital G-O-D, or individual God, G-O-D. Even though the Bible does. right, And even uses the plural in referring to the sons of God as gods. Jesus himself, John 10, right? So, but Trinitarians are, are fooling people. They are, or they're fooled themselves and just continuing the foolishness, But right? They're using the word God to mean person of the Trinity, a divine person who shares the essence of being of the Godhead, not an individual God. And if you don't press them on that, when they ask you that question, you'll be affirming something you haven't fully fleshed out of them yet, that you have to do to get this right. All right, let's take a look real quick at how things are in the chat. Good to see you all. Looks like you're having a good time. Thanks again, BJ, for your uh, 
contribution. Miroslav, good to see you. Most people still here. Servant of the Lord, Betsy, Bankhead, Henry, Pink Moon. Thank you all for joining us. Let's go ahead and conclude with the rest of that final part of the chapter 22. Right? So this is an example of a Sharpe's Rule text you can point to and say, right here, we have an exception to Sharpe's Rule. And if you say this involves proper nouns or the equivalent, right? There's no proper noun here or the, no proper name, but there's the equivalent of a proper name, basically, right? Some, some nouns become proper names, like Christ or, or like God, right? Or even Lord, right? They, they basically substituted the divine name for Lord, making it a proper name in a different sense. Either way. You can point to this text, and they won't disagree. It's an exception syntactically. They just might, again, just like we're telling them about in the New Testament text, they'll make a, a semantic exception. They'll say that the meaning either is one where they actually did identify the two as the same, and hence trying to say it is an example of Sharpe's rule, which in case would again contradict the early uh, evaluate early reference and representation of the Trinity. But they, they don't care about that. Not not really. They will after I go through this series, probably a little more. But they think they have enough in ways where they're already reading their doctrine into the New Testament, right? So they can do that with, with Polycarp, right? There's no problem for them. When they see God, again, to them, that's person of God. That's not an individual God like we think of it or the Bible presents it. And you have to know that, right? It happens right out of the gate with them. There really isn't anything to talk about if you can't get them to see that because it won't matter. You'll just be arguing about grammar and stuff, but the ultimate meaning is totally different anyway, right? Even if you granted them what they want grammatically, it still doesn't mean what they want it to mean. And so who cares? It's ultimately all consistent with what we mean because we're only using what the Bible tells us it means, contextually and explicitly. We bid you Godspeed, brethren, who walk according to the gospel and the word of Jesus Christ, with whom be glory to God and the Father and the Holy Spirit for the salvation of the holy elect, even as the blessed Polycarp suffered martyrdom, in whose footsteps it may be granted us to be found in the kingdom of Jesus Christ. Gaius copied this from the writings of Irenaeus, a disciple of Polycarp, and lived with Irenaeus, and I, Socrates, wrote it out in Corinth from the copies of Gaius. Grace be with you all. And I again, Ponius, Peonius, right? This is basically a, a history of the text, as I mentioned to you earlier. That's included with one of the manuscripts. I, and I again, Peonius, wrote it out from the former writings after searching for it because of the blessed Polycarp showing me it in a vision. Now here's something questionable, right? And this is from a later scribe. But I believe it does show that at least this person who wrote it believes Polycarp visited them in a vision. But that's not really consistent with, with biblical teaching, is it? So we have to be careful. Again, these aren't all authentic Polycarp references. Again, this is even clearly a note added by a later scribe. This isn't written by Polycarp, but it's kind of given a history of the manuscript in association with this individual. Who then says that the Lord Jesus may also gather me together with his elect into his heavenly kingdom, to whom be glory with the Father and the Holy Spirit forever and ever. Again, a later scribe writing this, but it provides an exception to the Granville Sharp rule. Nothing really inconsistent with the um, teaching about God, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. But we do have a couple things we need to look out for in here where it involved the apparent veneration of the flesh of, of a faithful individual, Right, being careful not to attach too much significance to claims of being visited by vision in visions by various individuals other than God the Father or Jesus or the Holy Spirit. Right, um, in any case, I think it's very clear, is it not? In our reading of the letter of, from Polycarp to the Philippians and in the martyrdom of Polycarp, everything that is associated with Polycarp's teaching is consistent with the biblical teaching about God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. None of it was presented in a Trinitarian context or an association with later Trinitarian metaphysics, metaphysics, which contradict the biblical teaching about God and His Son and the Holy Spirit. 
So it's important that we go through these early Christian writers and that we learn from them the things that either reflect or don't reflect what we have already learned and are learning from the Bible so that we can identify the early Christian writers and documents that are consistent with what we know to be true from the Bible. And we can identify where there are variations and departures from the biblical text and teaching that we believe, based on the best available evidence in the biblical text, represent the most authentic and original Christian teaching.